about where we come from and where we're going, right? And uh, if you have children, where your children are going. There's a few different things to consider, one of which are um, the areas around developmental psychology. So what I mean by that is who we pick as partners is predominantly determined by who raised us. That's, and I'm sure this is no news to you, but I'm just going to say a few things about this. So essentially, and it doesn't matter if you were raised by your parents or if other people raised you, someone raised you. And whoever raised you gave you the first imprint of love. And within that first imprint of love lies, it's like almost like a um, relationship DNA that's imprinted on you based on your first experiences of what love was. And that's, of course, tricky because not everybody has parents who just love them Um, because your parents come with imprints from their parents and so on and so on and so on. So um, in the first couple of years of our lives, I'm I'm simplifying, you know, something here for the sake of just diving into lineage and liberation. But in the first couple of years of our lives, we receive uh, the kind of treatment that we consider love, whatever that is. And it's like a home base, like an imprint that's created in our body that stays there. So as a, you know, as an example, if you had parents who were, only paying attention to you and giving you lots of attention when you were acting out, let's say, but otherwise they were quite neglectful, then getting attention for acting out, which is most likely negative attention, is what you consider love. And then, of course, years later, that's your strategy for getting love. All the while, your adult self wants love in a non-confrontational way. Uh, you know, because you grow up and you realize, oh, being screamed at is not really the love I want. But some part of you goes, only when you're being screamed at, ah, this feels good, I'm home. So in every human, there's kind of a home, um, and the reason I'm saying home is not necessarily that it's your home, but in your body, it feels like home. And that imprint then influences whom you pick as partners. Um, And the, of course, funny thing is about this, funny, uh, that the adult part of you goes, I don't want a man who is like my father, let's say, right? (laughs) Ever ever uttered those words. Um, But of course, so you pick somebody who is exactly not like your father, and then within a few couple, few years, they actually do turn into your father. Uh, and miraculously, and you don't even know why or how, and um, you go, you know, don't treat me like this, but some part of you goes, ah, this feels so good, this feels like home. So that's one aspect that runs into lineage and liberation. Um, We take a lot of our both conscious and unconscious assumptions about relationship from what we see our parents do. Right. with us and with each other, of course. And uh, we also shape ourselves so that we are lovable to our parents. It's one of the big things to consider when we look at developmental uh, psychology is that we have to behave in ways that give us love or at least shelter, food and care and safety, what we consider shelter, you know, food, care and safety. So our parents shape our behavior and who we become through what they reward. Right? So if you were raised by a mother who needed you to be a good boy, let's say, right, and you would only get love when you did exactly right by your mother and any um, deviation from being her kind of good boy gave you the cold shoulder or punishment then you can't actually become who you want to be because you have to conform enough so you get fed and clothed and loved and hugged. Or if you're a girl and your father really wanted a boy, let's say, and you become this rough and tumble tomboy, 
but inter in internally you would like to be a lot more girly, but daddy wants somebody that can mow the lawn or something like that, right? You have to shape yourself so that love is given to you. And that sets us up for relationships, of course. So we'll be looking at that uh, in quite a bit of detail. Then other things that go into how we develop our family stories and themes. Um, what did you say yesterday? <laughs> I was joking. About yes. That. The bones never quit. <laughs> yes, so in my family, the bones never quit. That's not it's, your actual. That's motto. not my actual motto, but it's it's not that far away from it, right? So 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 there's these kind of family folklore of things that you um, inherit that that are certain behaviors or models or themes that run through your family. Uh, everything from, well, no one in our family has ever kept money to... Um, We're a working class family, you know, not yeah. like those posh people. Uh, yeah. So, so these things, of course, um, go in. Um, also coming into this particular area is um, how we cope. So with coping, I mean, when the going gets tough, um, what do you do or how do you use um, distractions or numbing agents? So in some families, people drink, right? And then uh, you'll, you'll hear, well, you know, we think it's genetic, it's the alcoholism that's passed down through generations. Maybe uh, nowadays there's research that it's not genetic, but it's epigenetic. But it's also when you see your father cope with stress a certain way and your mother copes with stress a certain way. Or some people cope with eating. Some people shop. Some people use TV. Some people use sex. So there's all kinds of different numbing agents that run through families uh, because you see it, and that's how it's being handled. And, uh, of course, um, then the last bit is that regardless of... Um, familial patterning, there's also just uh, receiving certain information in utero from your mother because whatever your mother does while she's pregnant with you shapes the receptors on the cells of the fetus. So if your mother gets very easily upset and has these spikes of you know, adrenaline, your cells as a fetus start forming with lots of adrenaline receptors. So you then have a lot more receptors for adrenaline than you have for, let's say, dopamine. And that, of course, shapes your whole being based on what happened during pregnancy. So those are the kind of considerations that, that flow into this weekend on the psychological area. Then the next thing, and this is what kind of sparked uh, me wanting to do this workshop finally, is uh, I've had a real uh, strong interest in epigenetics in the last 10 years or so. And epigenetics is a fairly new and still somewhat controversial uh, science, but it is a science, where it's been found out and being studied uh, that certain aspects of trauma and experience gets passed down through the generations on the outside of the DNA. So it doesn't alter the DNA structure. Essentially, an epigenetic trait is a stable trait that's passed down through the generations, but it's not altering the DNA. It sits on the outside. Epi means on top of or in addition to. And so what it looks like is on the outside of the DNA, there's these things called uh, methylated DNA strands. And on that strand, uh, there is information that is passed down. So far, they found four generations that it's reliably passed down. It might be more, but at least four generations where you are essentially carrying the traumas of your ancestors. And of course, anybody who lives nowadays comes from a long line of people who've been brutalized through wars, uh, you know, rounded up, killed, famines, rapes, you know, I mean, there's barely anyone who has an unscathed familial history. Uh, these particular informations can be healed and how they can be healed. And this is the really, really important piece. And this is why you're here is that 
they have found, because of course, you know, the only reason anything ever gets researched is because of pharmacology. Right? Pharmaceutical companies want to find things that they can patent and sell. That's, it's just big business. So in the researching and trying to find drugs that heal the, the epigenetic trauma patterns, they've realized, oops, these drugs already exist and they've existed for many, many, many thousands of years. And they're essentially called ethnobotanicals, so meaning drug, plant medicines. So everything from ayahuasca to iboga to uh, uh, mushrooms, um, uh, peyote, you know, San Pedro, all of those kind of things, all the different plant medicines have shown, particularly mushrooms, and also uh, some opiates have shown to essentially remove the information from the outside of the DNA. So have, now we're not giving you drugs this weekend, uh, but so have um, pretty much every shamanic ritual. And that, that's a, a very interesting finding because you can look at the research and see that all the things that shamans do are the things that clear the epigenetic information. So those are things like smudging, you know, smudging, burning herbs and, and, and having incense, drumming, rhythmic motion, lots of rhythmic, very monotonous rhythmic motion, um, chanting, um, praying, fasts, vision quests, uh, heroes' journeys, journeys, you know, going out in the wilderness for days on end, not eating and finding your way back home. All of those things are actually the things that clear the, um, the information of the, of the DNA. So now, of course, they're trying to come up with, you know, other ways to do it that make them money. But the important piece and why we are talking about this is you can clear it and you can clear it through methods and ways that have existed for probably millions of years, not just thousands, but millions of years. So the shamanic aspect is something that we will um, include here as a way for you to learn how to clear things from your system in a ritual way. And then finally... The last aspect that uh, falls into this is in my particular lineage, uh, which is a shamanic lineage in its origin, right? Because the, the early tantric lineages were very earth-based, and particularly the women-driven um, lineage are not very scholarly. They are very earth-based, ritual-based, food-based, chant, singing, movement, painting, drawing based and in that tradition there is a um, there's there's two strains of healing so to speak these kind of patterns one is the engagement with art beauty art uh, in, in my tradition it's chalk drawing mandala drawing and um, the going into taboo areas now you have to be careful with that because you don't want to you know traumatize yourself but in, in my lineage, uh, going and doing things that are considered taboos are a very big uh, th you know, through line where you essentially look at what are your societal taboos and you work against that in the way that it frees you to be a full human being, not repressed by certain things that are not yours. Well, the old examples are the five M's, right? The, the, the classic tantric example is the, the thing, the five M's. It's called the five M's. It's left hand path. Um, now, of course, most of these things in the West are like breaking of the marriage vows, wine, meat, done, 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 right? But there's other taboos. Gluten. <laughs> Gluten, yes. <laughs> That's funny. So you do all these visualizations that... Um, free your body from the cringe, so to speak. Yeah. So that's another way of dealing with lineage and liberating yourself from things. And then finally, you know, the last piece in lineage, of course, and this depends on 
do you know your parents, don't you know your parents? But uh, most people get very excited when they get to see where they're coming from simply because there's such a strong feeling of having a tribe, knowing where you belong. Right? Because when you know where you belong, you fit in somewhere. And often when people are adopted, you know, it becomes very, very important, even though on a rational level you could say, well, you know, my mother couldn't or wouldn't uh, want to raise me. So the people who are raising me are actually loving me and wanting me and really wanted me. But in most people's mind, when it comes to adoption, they go like, well, why did my mother not want me? You know, why was I, uh, you know, cast forth from my tribe? And so there's a very strong... Um, impulse to want to know where you come from and how you fit in. And that's why nowadays, of course, I'm waiting for mine, but it's been months. You can do DNA tests, right? And you can uh, uh, do family trees online, of course, and all kinds of things so that you know where you're coming from. And of course, that's useful from a medical standpoint, uh, even though I think they outlawed that now. You're no longer allowed. They used, they used to be DNA tests where they would tell you what you were susceptible to um, illness-wise, uh, and they uh, outlawed that. So you can no longer uh, know that. But you can, through your strains of DNA, determine what you're susceptible to or not. Uh, but aside from that, it just gives you an explanation of certain things. And that usually settles people down because they have a tribe that they belong to uh, or an excuse for why they're behaving so badly, <laughs> depending, <laughs> depending on how it goes. Right? So a tribal identity and a sense of belonging is the positive aspect of knowing about your lineage. The negative aspect, as I said, is it's an excuse. Right? Um, and um, it also in a certain way can um, feel like you're free of the responsibility of um, forging your own path because it's always been like that. So all of these things uh, go into this weekend in, in a variety of ways where we'll have created a whole bunch of exercises uh, that will allow you to engage with this. some of them directly, some of them are talking processes, and some of them are processes that allow your body to a, feel it, and B, release certain things and, and, you know, kind of redo certain things. So one of the interesting things, and some of you, of course, know this because you've done some of this work, is that when your relationship to these things changes, the outside world does change, very substantially so. God knows why, but it does. <laughs> and uh, it's one of the beautiful mysteries how it goes but it certainly happens and um, that in itself is a very interesting exploration I think.